I think I'll do a recapitulation of the essential aspects of the teaching which I have told you about so far. Put it together in a sort of a telegram style. When one first hears about it, it seems to be a a lot of unrelated bits and pieces. But as one becomes familiar with the teaching, it's one beautiful picture, like a jigsaw puzzle, where all the pieces fit together and make one whole. And that is the intelligent mind's ability to make the connections. Without making the connections, it's going to remain bits and pieces. And when it remains bits and pieces, it will not show the path nor the goal. So with all these bits and pieces, one has to try to see how they fit together. Of course, I've only shown you a part of the Buddha's teaching, naturally in this short period of time, but it's been an essential part. And I'll try and put together for you the connections so that you can possibly see the completeness of it. Now, as these bits and pieces fall into place, they can only do so when one is actually practicing them. They will never fall into place intellectually unless one makes this a lifetime study. Then they can do that too. They can fall into place but it still doesn't accomplish what the Buddha had in mind. But if one practices each of those bits and pieces, they fall into place immediately because they have an inner reaction. And what we experience within, we can understand also the understood experience. As long as one doesn't do it, it appears to be a lot of unrelated subjects. Essentially, the Buddha's path is a path of purification. What do we purify? Heart and mind. We are constantly concerned with purifying this body. In the old days, or even today, in India, the Brahmins would go into the Ganges River to purify. They'd dip down under the water, one of the dirtiest rivers in the world, by the way. They'd dip down in the water because it's supposed to be a holy river. And doing that on certain holy days and doing it sometimes even every morning was supposed to purify the Buddha said, nobody becomes purified by dipping down into a river. The only way one becomes purified is by purifying heart and mind. The mind, as our thinking process and thinking ability, the four supreme efforts, avoiding overcoming, developing, maintaining. Now those four words say actually everything. Avoiding the unwholesome, overcoming the unwholesome, developing the wholesome, maintaining the wholesome. In every thought 
process. The four supreme efforts, not to let an unwholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen, avoiding it. Not to let it continue which has already arisen, overcoming it. To make a wholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen, developing it. To make it continue when it has already arisen, maintaining it. Avoiding, overcoming, developing, maintaining. Four words to be written in huge letters and to be hung over one's bed or in smaller, le smaller letters at one's dashboard. If one doesn't do it every day, it gets easily forgotten. If we forget it, we continue the way we have been. The purification of our thinking process goes hand in hand with the purification of our emotions. Same process, avoiding, overcoming, developing, maintaining. With the emotions, to recognize that there are four supreme emotions, that all others, negative emotions primarily of course can be either avoided or overcome that the positive ones can be developed and maintained everything that has to do with hate with fear with dislike with rejection with resistance with envy with jealousy with pride, with anxiety, all of those, avoiding. Avoiding is the most useful one because we don't even give the mind and the heart a chance to fall into disrepair. When we're unable to avoid, let's overcome them. The process of overcoming is the substitution. Just as we substitute in meditation the thoughts which have no place in meditation, substitute them with the attention on the breath in the same way we substitute in daily life. Substitute that which is unwholesome with the wholesome, whether it's thought or emotion. A non-meditator, and some meditators, believe what they're thinking and believe they are unwholesome emotions. That's one of the biggest mistakes we can make. The reason we do that is because we think we own those. Only a fool owns unwholesome thoughts and emotions. Why own something which brings nothing but unhappiness? There's nothing to own about it. The only thing to do with it is to avoid and overcome. As long as we think we own it, we think they're correct. And when we think they're correct, we start blaming ourselves or others. <coughs> what it needs in order to do this purification in daily life of thought and emotion is to have an objective appraisal of oneself, which is mindfulness. Mindfulness which is, which is objectivity, knowing only just being aware, not owning, not keeping, not having, but knowing. Now knowing then makes it possible to change. Without knowing, we can't change. So mindfulness is 
the single most important mental formation which we can bring to bear upon the purification process. Without mindfulness, which means introspection, self-knowing, objectivity towards oneself, without that, the purification process cannot take place because we don't know what's going on within. So mindfulness is the first of the five spiritual faculties. Is that which leads us, which is the mental stance that we can take in order to know what needs to be avoided what needs to be overcome, what needs to be developed and to be maintained. If we don't know, we can't do it. Our belief system, which includes all sorts of views and opinions, attitudes and ideas, is constantly in the way because this belief system is an ego support. Naturally, we are looking for ego support because the ego is so fragile that it needs to be bolstered constantly. Some people's egos are so fragile that it falls apart at the slightest indication that it isn't being supported. Other people's ego is a little stronger. It takes a little more of a push. But we're looking for ego support everywhere, and our belief system is ego support. So as long as we are looking for that, we won't let go of our belief system. And as long as we don't let go of the belief system, we are subjective and not objective. We are totally concerned with what's me and mine, and what I want and what I don't want. But since what I want and what I don't want is individually totally different and never has, any universal truth in it, it can't be extremely helpful. Universal truth is the only thing that will always stand investigation. Everything else falls apart if one really gets at it and looks at it with a very clear mind. So we need mindfulness. Now mindfulness we also learn in meditation. Anapanasati. Sati is mindfulness in Pali. S-A-T-I. Anapana, in-breath, out-breath. Mindfulness of in-breath, out-breath. We're learning it in meditation in order to use it in everyday life. We're learning mindfulness. We're learning substitution. We must use those learning procedures that we do in meditation to continue this in everyday life. The more we do it in everyday life, the easier it is in meditation. The easier it becomes in meditation, the easier it is in everyday life. Our daily life is our life. Meditation retreat is only a special time. And our practice of spirituality needs daily life, not special time. This is one of the biggest mistakes that the organized religions make. All of them. Like going to church on Sundays. What's wrong with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday? And it's not just in Christianity, it's in every religion. Spirituality is a way of being and nothing special. It's just a different focus. Mindfulness is the essence of our knowing. We have four foundations, four ways of being mindful. All of them need to be used in everyday life. First one is the body. We learn that in meditation. Watching the breath. 
watching the walking, mindfulness of the body, kaya nupasana, kaya is the body. The second one, mindfulness of feeling, vedana nupasana. This feeling particularly um, used in the sweeping meditation, the second foundation of mindfulness but also used when we become aware of the sensation that the breath creates when it hits nostrils and throat and lungs and so forth. It's also the second foundation included. The third foundation of mindfulness is our thinking, that we know we're thinking and actually giving it a name. That's our labeling process in meditation, which we continue in daily life. And the fourth foundation of mindfulness is the content of the thought. That's when we either avoid or overcome, develop or maintain, because we will know at that time whether the content is wholesome or unwholesome. All four of these foundations of mindfulness are being practiced in the meditation. Breath, walking, body. Sensation in the sweeping and in the breath uh, touch, the second foundation, mindfulness of feeling. The thought, labeling, third foundation. And content of thought when we become aware that there is an unwholesomeness in the thought which is more geared to our daily living than to the meditation practice because in the meditation practice we let go of every thought in order to get back to the meditation subject whereas in daily life we want to let go of the unwholesome ones. So our foundations of mindfulness are the foundations of meditation and are the foundations of the practice in daily living. They are also the purification process. Buddha said, the one way for the purification of beings, for overcoming pain, grief and lamentation, for the final elimination of all dukkha, for entering the noble path, for realizing Nibbana, is mindfulness. The one way, Ekayana. It's a purification process because we can either be mindful or negative. We can't be both. When we are mindful, we are objective. We're looking to see what's going on. We're not subjective, being engulfed in whatever it is that's going on. Mindfulness makes it possible to substitute. Just as we do that in in the meditation, to substitute the thought for the attention on the breath, with mindfulness in daily living we can do the same. The meditative path effectively counters the hindrances. The hindrances are our impurities. The five hindrances. Desire for sensual gratification, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and skeptical doubt. Five hindrances. Five factors of meditation which effectively work against that. The more of those factors in meditation arise, the more effective we have an antidote. The less of it arises, the less there's an antidote, but something always happens. And that's why everybody who has meditated in the past, whether they have become very concentrated or not, has always found some benefit. Five factors of meditation, initial application to the meditation subject, 
continued application to the meditation subject. Then, the first step into the jhanas, delight, then joy, and the one that goes with all of them, one-pointedness. The initial application and the continued application is compared to hitting the bell. When we hit the bell, that's initial. The tone which follows is continued, which means we're staying actually on the meditation subject. The five hindrances, our impurities, all of all every human being has them they are not a cause for blame but they are a cause for recognition and they are also a cause for seeing them in oneself and thereby being able to love oneself in spite of them or with them <coughs> and therefore not being judgmental towards others who have exactly the same hindrances. If we want to be judgmental, we have to be judgmental towards ourselves. In order to be judgmental towards others, that means we're discontented with ourselves, which does not lend itself to good meditation. One of the Pure emotions, namely joy, has to be at the beginning of meditation. The joy of being able to meditate, to have found a path, to have found something that one can practice with skill and confidence. The five hindrances, which are an outcome of the underlying impurity in every human being, namely the ignorance, ignoring absolute truth. Absolute truth, which means that once having seen it completely, there is no individuality, no me, no ego left. Ignoring that brings about the other two of the three taints, the desire for sensual gratification and the desire to be, which results in our five hindrances. These are our impurities. There are no cause for concern other than recognition no blame, change. It's a slow but certain way of inner growth. Inner growth is spiritual life. Spiritual life is not sitting cross-legged on a pillow. That's only one of the means. Spiritual life is also not doing different things from everybody else. Spiritual life is purification. Recognition, no blame, change. That's spiritual life. It's not difficult, but it has to have perseverance, determination, and patience and of course it also needs an understanding of the priority of it it's almost like we always think first we have to do all the other things and then we'll get to that it's the other way around first we need to get to that and then all the other things fall into place very easily. Everything works a hundred times easier. Nothing has so much heaviness anymore or such a burden. It just flows 
because there is another priority. It's not first I have to clean up the house and then I'll meditate. It's first I'll meditate and then I'll clean up the house. And all other examples just like that. This makes everything much easier because the purification that takes place automatically is a lifting off the heaviness, the lifting off the burden. And with less heaviness in one's makeup, less worry, less restlessness, less ill will, less desire, the whole thing, everything one has to do is very easy because one doesn't get interrupted by all those difficulties in the mind. It just flows. The meditative practice is the means, not the goal. The goal is a complete understanding and and a complete experience of absolute truth, which is quite possible. If we didn't all carry the seed of enlightenment within, the Buddha's 45 years of teaching would have been in vain. He taught people just like us, very ordinary, everyday kind of people. And he did it every day of his life after he became enlightened from the age of 35 to the age of 80. Notwithstanding sickness, inclement weather, difficulties, he sometimes went to teach one person because he knew that that one person would be able to understand and benefit. Other times he taught thousands of people. Everybody Every single human being carries the seed of enlightenment within. The more we get rid of the impurities, the easier we can get in touch with that jewel. The jewel lies in our mind and heart. If we had a very valuable jewel in our house, I'm sure we wouldn't let it get dirty. We would watch it very carefully. We'd probably pack it in cotton wool. We might even lock it up so that nobody steals it. We certainly would look after it very well. The most valuable jewel, nothing compared to anything that can be found underground, lies in our own heart and mind. We mustn't allow it to become dirty. We mustn't allow to have it scratched. We mustn't allow to have its luster totally hidden. Our purification path opens up the possibility of seeing that luster, that brilliance within. And when we see that seed, then we know what is our priority to develop, cultivate that so that it becomes a great blossom. The five factors of the meditation, when it becomes concentrated to that point, are our support system for the purification from the hindrances. Naturally, we also have to use the purification during daily life. The purification for sensual desire in daily life is analysis. Seeing the parts and not the whole. For ill will is substituting with love and compassion. For sloth and torpor is determination and effort. For restlessness and worry is insight into impermanence, insight 
into the uselessness of our constant change that we don't accomplish anything by it and against skeptical doubt inquiry inquiry and doubt are not the same thing inquiry is an honest and sincere wish to find out skeptical doubt is a cynical rejection and usually leads nowhere always leads nowhere not usually it can't lead anywhere but honest and sincere inquiry is requested by the Buddha he's the only spiritual master that always wanted his disciples to inquire by themselves he said do not believe any teaching because it has been handed down from teacher to disciple do not believe any spiritual teaching because it belongs to a tradition do not believe any spiritual teaching because it's written in a holy book do not believe any spiritual teaching because it agrees with what you think of anyway do not ag- believe any spiritual teaching because your friends and relations believe it do not believe any spiritual te- teaching because it has some mystical connotation or something mystical in it that you can't understand and that seems to have something in it don't believe any spiritual teaching because it's logical do not believe it because the teacher is a reputable person do not believe it because the teacher said so no guru trip find out for yourself have enough confidence to try it out and see for yourself this is the only time in human history that a spiritual master included himself in this do not believe because obviously the teaching is a tradition it is handed down from teacher to disciple the master was a reputable person the master did say so but he said do not believe it find out for yourself when you find out for yourself whether it is wholesome beneficial and helpful then use it if not don't this is a very famous discourse of the buddha i want to give you the essence of it the kalama sutta the kalamas were a, um, a tribe a warrior tribe a very intelligent people and they had the buddha visited them and they asked him the uh, village elder got up and asked him said that so many teachers have come to our capital and they all can explain their own teachings so extremely well but they all say that everybody else's teaching is wrong and now we don't know whom to believe anymore and the buddha said you're quite right kalamas you have doubt in a doubtful matter and then he gave them these points how not to believe i think we could uh, substitute kalamas with california <laughs> <laughs> nothing has changed in two and a half thousand years <laughs> when we find out that the guidelines of the buddha work even one of them then we will continue to use them because where can we find anything better that will help us if they don't work then we'll have to try something else the buddha himself called himself only the shower of the way that's all 
if we want to use that way, that's fine. The purification, which is the essence of the practice, is therefore geared towards heart and mind, towards letting go of that which is disturbing, unwholesome, unhappiness producing, and substituting it with that which is the opposite. Naturally, we have to learn the meditative path. And I've given the indications and the explanations of each step up to the fourth meditative absorption. But equally so, we have to learn the skill of substitution in daily life. We must use our intelligence <clears throat> and we must use the innate goodness which everyone has to let that come to the fore so there is the connection between mindfulness as the first of the five spiritual faculties which makes it possible to recognize then faith or confidence to try it out and wisdom to know what to do the next two spiritual faculties and then concentration and energy concentration and meditation energy which means that we do not let ourselves be deterred by difficulties we either avoid or overcome the mental energy becomes much greater through concentration but it also needs to be there already in order to concentrate when there is joy about the path and the direction in one's life mental energy is easy when life seems to have no particular straightforward goal when there are just chores responsibilities and daily drudgery then mental energy dissipates that's why a spiritual life should have priority because that brings with it the mental energy because we know that everything else is secondary it all needs to be done as long as we have a body we've got to do those things but they don't come first with the joy of the spiritual path the mental energy arises automatically and with that we then have the also the ability to concentrate in the jhanas so we have two things that we work on we have our meditative path which is an automatic purification system and we have our daily life in which we watch out for thought and emotion and make sure that we catch at least half of them that are unwholesome if we catch all of them that's even better eventually having caught so many and substituted it so many times they don't seem to arise so much anymore just like in the meditation in the first few days the thoughts were all over the place eventually they calm down and there are less and less of them and then one day there aren't any there's just meditation it's the same in daily life in the beginning of practice there are so many unwholesome thoughts and unwholesome emotions and as we recognize them and substitute with the wholesome ones 
over and over again, they become less and less. Because we can feel the benefit of having the wholesome one. It becomes easy. It becomes a way of being which is undisturbed. And so we don't allow the unwholesome ones anymore because we have noticed what it's like to have the wholesome ones. So we need to, we can avoid them. And that avoidance then makes it possible for us to get nearer and nearer to that beautiful jewel that we carry within, which is the seed of enlightenment, which is total purity, which everybody has. The more we avoid the unwholesomeness, the easier it is to find that brilliance within. And the longing and the yearning that people have, and most people would have it, is exactly that, to get to that inner strength and inner fulfillment. But we do have to purify in order to get near it. I think I will add to this what I've just said. The other two supreme emotions, which I have not described yet in detail, I have described in detail metta, love, and equanimity, upekka. But I have not described in detail yet compassion and sympathetic joy. Compassion is karuna in Pali. The far enemy of compassion is, of course, cruelty. That's very easy. But the near enemy is pity, being sorry for somebody. Now, if we're sorry for somebody, that means we feel sorry. We either suffer with that person, and then in have, instead of having one sufferer, we've got two. And the first one hasn't got much help by that. In fact, the first one might feel guilty about having made the other one suffer, too. Pity is also, very often, a separation from the other person. We're sorry for them, but we're glad it's not us. That's also common. But compassion is something entirely different. Com is with. Passion, feeling, with feeling, empathy. It's a with feeling with the other person. Where with that other person can really feel with the other person, but do not become entwined in sorrow, sorrow, which is being sorry, pity, and being having sorrow, but probably be able, by having worked with our own difficulties might be able to show a way out. In any case, what we do is we show understanding for the other person's difficulties because we've understood our own. Compassion also is a very important helpmate when there we have difficulty in relationships with other people and who hasn't. If somebody is very unpleasant, we can be quite sure that that person is very unhappy. So we can have compassion with that because we know what it feels like to be unhappy. We don't have to be sorry for that person. We know what it feels like ourselves to be unhappy and therefore to be also unpleasant. And when we do that over and over again, and of course it's not going to work every time, but when we do it many times, 
it becomes habitual and we won't get angry at anybody because we can see quite clearly that their unpleasantness is due to unhappiness and we know what it's like and we have empathy for that we feel with that person and when that other person realizes our empathy it may help them it often does it diffuses their anger not always but often compassion is very often the trigger for love for the unconditional and independent love that metta is. Because when we feel with the person, it means we understand the other person, and therefore it will be much easier to also generate love for that person. Sympathetic joy or joy with others has as a far enemy envy. But as a near enemy, it has hypocrisy. It's those little white lies that isolate that person on their good fortune. And we do that with our words and inside we think why does it have to happen to him or to her? I mean, it's not that nice a person. <laughs> I could have done with the same good luck. And that's the social hypocrisy with which we often are burdened without actually recognizing it for what it is. It's actually lying. And it's a, an untruth which makes it impossible to see ourselves as clearly as we should or could. <coughs> Joy with others is much easier when we recognize the fact that we're all in this together, every single one of us. And whatever we see in another person, that's what we've got ourselves. Everybody's our mirror. Sometimes, of course, we may be able to see something that we used to have and don't have anymore. And then compassion can arise, that the other person hasn't got rid of that yet. <laughs> but most of the time we see exactly what we've got. It's like a whole hall of mirrors. Everybody is depicting exactly what we've got in there. It's very interesting. We couldn't see it otherwise. We wouldn't know what it is. We couldn't give it a name. So when we see ourselves as part of the whole and when we recognize the fact that we are just as fluid, changing and impermanent as all nature around us as everybody else that we consist of the four primary elements in the body and the four aggregates in the mind then it becomes quite clear to us that it doesn't matter who has the good fortune as long as somebody has it and we rejoice in the fact that somebody had good fortune no longer does it have to happen to this particular body and mind and when we rejoice with others we have a surefire antidote for depression depression arises because there's nothing to rejoice about maybe there isn't anything but somebody will have something to rejoice about the happier we are about other people's good fortune the happier they can be if we are happy, we are giving them the gift of happiness. It's one of the great gifts that we can distribute. It doesn't cost any money, 
but it costs effort. The kind of effort that most people are neither willing nor able to expend. It's an effort which brings enormous results in one's own happiness and in the happiness of others. Rejoicing with other people's good fortune is very often also connected to showing other people what good fortune they're having. They don't even know about it. We have the absurd notion to take all the good things for granted and to grumble about all the bad things. It's very interesting. It's very universal. Instead of being utterly grateful, utterly joyful about the great good fortune that everybody has who has enough food, enough shelter, enough clothing, and on top of that, all the senses intact, the body still functioning, and being able to hear the true Dhamma. Such good fortune is the greatest good fortune a human being can have. We take our breath for granted, we take our food for granted, and yet how many people don't have it? We take the ability to see, hear, taste, touch, smell, and think for granted how many people don't have it. We take so much for granted that we grumble about the smallest things. We get angry about a word we hear that we didn't like. We get upset about somebody who may look at us sideways. He probably didn't even see us. But we think he looked at us sideways. And we forget about all the great good fortune that each one of us has. The Buddha went on a walk one time with his monks along the seashore and he said to the monks, imagine, monks, that there is a blind turtle swimming in the oceans of the world and there's also a wooden yoke swimming in the oceans of the world. The blind turtle comes up for air once every hundred years. Do you think, monks, that When this blind turtle comes up for air once every hundred years, she could stick her head through the wooden yoke. The monk said, no, it's impossible. They couldn't be at the same place at the same time. The Buddha said, it's not impossible, it's improbable. And the same improbability reigns over the birth as a human being with all senses and all limbs intact, with all necessities for life and on top of that, being able to hear the true Dhamma. Now, if we could remember that, whether this is an exaggeration or not, I wouldn't like to get into that, but if we could remember that, it might help us to recognize all the wonderful things that we can rejoice about, and all the wonderful things we can rejoice with with other people. And it would make us less judgmental and it would make us less finicky about small matters where we scold and blame for matters which have no intrinsic value. We remember that story. It's easy to remember. A blind turtle and a wooden yoke, very easy to remember. So this would help us probably to see the whole and not always just see the trees, but see the whole forest for a change. The four supreme emotions, 
metta karuna mudito upekka, love, compassion, joy with others, and equanimity. Those to be substituted for any of our unwholesome ones. Hopefully, this overview may have put it a little bit more together what needs to be done. The Buddha's path is a practice path. That's all it is, practice. It's skills, learning new skills, the kind of skills which change our life completely. The skills which are connected to our feelings, to our thoughts, to our reactions. They're all skills. We can all learn them. And we all have the ability to become totally free. That's enough for tonight. If you have any questions, this is the time to ask them. Yes? Curious question about the, the choice of the word mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Uh, how is that word chosen? It sounds like, in a way, we're actually looking at the mind from somewhere else. The choice of that word, yes. Um, I have also looked at that. It means the mind is full of that which is really happening. In other words, there's no embellishments. It's just straightforward. Foot moving, mind knows foot moving. Washing dishes while washing dishes. Every day somebody's washing dishes here, I presume. Huh? Tomorrow, when you do it, are you having another chance at washing dishes yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you. Well, I'm chopping, uh, okay, good. Shopping vegetables while shopping vegetables. Watch it tomorrow. Watch it whether, while you're chopping the vegetables, you're thinking, I wonder why they have to have carrots again. I really don't like carrots. (laughs) Couldn't they find anything else in the shops? They should have sent me to shop. And so on, and so on. Or whether you are chopping carrots while chopping carrots. Only the movement. Watch it. That's mindfulness. Doing that only with mind and body together. Check it out. Eating while eating. What else? Or judging. Oh, yesterday it was actually better. Wonder who was cooking today. (laughs) And all the rest of that story that goes on in the mind. So that kind of thing. That's non-mindfulness. That's embellishment. So mindfulness is being with that which is actually happening. And for the dishwashers, knowing only the dishwashing, the movement of the hand on the dish, or the holding it under the water, being aware of that motion of the hand that's holding that dish. It removes any problem that would can possibly have for that time because one can't watch the hand on the, on the dish and have a problem at the same time. It also removes broken dishes, not so many <laughs> broken dishes. It makes everything run smoothly and easily. One can accomplish about a hundred times more than people usually do with mindfulness because one doesn't get sidetracked. And also, it keeps the mind in its place where it belongs. And when it's kept in its place during the daily activities, then it has a much easier time to be staying in its place in meditation. So mindfulness is just being with that. Tomorrow, when you chop vegetables, you try it, okay? Okay. Yes. Does mindfulness also mean uh, thinking when thinking? Mm-hmm. It means 
it actually means knowing that one is thinking, recognizing whether it is appropriate at that time, and if it is appropriate and wholesome at that time, to continue with it. Mindfulness is a mental formation. Mindfulness is a mental formation. And it's the one mental formation which the Buddha said it is the one way for the purification of beings. Which includes, of course, the meditation because it also needs mindfulness. It is a mental formation. Perception is labeling. And the other one is feeling or sense contact. Yes, the perception says um, when there's an unpleasant feeling, the perception says pain. But mindfulness stays just with unpleasant feeling. That's all it does. It doesn't have to have the, that labeling in it. It can if it wishes. Yes? Well then, what's the relation? That's it. The observer is standing outside of the mind, right? Ooh, <laughs> you have a hard time doing that. <laughs> well, Where are you going to put him? <laughs> well, you said earlier that all there is is part of the mind, right? Right. So observer is mindfulness. It's a mental formation. looking at what's happening mindfulness is a mental formation and when mindfulness is uh, aroused when that mental formation is aroused you don't get any other you can be mindful of a physical happening you can be mindful of a feeling you can be attentive to the content of your thought you're mindful of that, whatever is happening, you know it. At first the content has happened, and then you know it. You can't do it simultaneously. You first have to have the content in order to know it. And the mindfulness of having known that there is thinking. For instance, in the meditation, first you think, and then you know you've thought. You can't have it simultaneously. So mindfulness ar is ar uh, arises when there is introspection. That's also another word for it. Observer is another word for it. You can use the word observer instead of mindfulness. The word mindfulness is bandied about an awful lot. And it becomes overworked. But we have to keep using the same word so that we know what we're talking about. But the word observer is a good substitute. The same thing. Is that clear or something else about that? Hmm? Um, I, I just have to digest it. I okay, I'm, good. It sounds like I am my mind when I'm being mindful. That, that's who I am. I mean, if you I, think that, that's what you are, yes. You I just thought it. that. Pardon? You just thought that. So if you think that, that's what it is. <laughs> yes? Uh, is Buddhism uh, inconsistent with or is, uh, does it contradict other beliefs? For example, uh, uh, you had a Christian who was interested, but they were afraid that they may undermine their Christianity, for example. How is that dealt with? Well, it's up to the person. Uh, if, they, if they use the Buddhist guidelines and teachings, they will come 
really use it and practice it, they will come to a different understanding, uh, different from the dogma of the church, and certainly different from the theology that's being taught. But one of the greatest mystics of the Christian mystics of the Middle Ages, Meister Eckhart, was, in my opinion, fully enlightened. Um, but that's a personal opinion, so it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, and he said, God exists because a creature exists. Because I think there's God, that's why there's God. But behind God, there's a Godhead. And he had a hard time escaping the Inquisition. And his teaching was banned. And it's only now that there are some um, places where it's being rejuvenated. But because it was banned for 500 years, the whole Christian mysticism has been buried. It's probably alive in very small pockets somewhere we hardly ever hear about. But as a whole, it's gone because the church didn't like it. But if a person was to practice Buddhism, a Christian was to practice Buddhism, and mind you, most people that I ever uh, get in contact with are Christians practicing Buddhism. I mean, what else? That's how they were born, as Christians. Um, they would see Christianity in a far broader sense and in a far more satisfying sense and that would be the desirable thing it's not necessary to be a Buddhist it's not necessary to be period so why should it be necessary to be a Buddhist what it is necessary is to see truth to find truth so it would be helpful it is hopefully helpful to anyone who will practice. Yes? Um, just what you talk about brings up something that I hadn't thought before, but I grew up a Christian, and um, what I don't hear is any reference to the Holy Spirit or to grace or to I mean, I do hear a reference to mystery, but maybe not mystery in the moment, active in our life. Uh, the Buddha said, and many of the um, Buddhist um, Buddha's um, statues are depicted with his left hand open like this on over the left knee. And he said, I have taught with an open hand, not with a closed fist. There is no secret, no mystery, open to anyone. There's nothing mysterious. It can be um, seen and, and understood by anyone. No mystery at all. Mystery and mysticism are not the same thing. Mysticism is one thing, mystery is another. And grace, when we purify ourselves, and when we act within grace, graciousness, then we will have that within us. If we take the necessary steps, that is what we then have as a result of that. The, um, the idea of the Holy Spirit is that what is called the seed of enlightenment within. There's nothing outside of us that's going to do it for us. But we can, we can become it. So the whole practice of the Buddhist path is learning to become that which may be expressed in those words or in other words. But nothing that comes from outside and does it for you. That is a great difference of the dogma, a totally different approach 
There's nothing outside that will do it. You've got to do it yourself. It's a do-it-yourself job. Well, that's the difference between religion and mysticism. Hmm. Yes, quite so. That's quite so. The mystic has always done it. And religion often claims that they'll do it for you. And the Buddha uh, actually was a reformer. And Jesus was too. And of course, both are totally misunderstood usually. And Jesus has a much harder time being properly understood than the Buddha. Because the Buddha had the good fortune to teach for 45 years, whereas Jesus only taught less than three years. So he is much more misunderstood. Uh, the Buddha was a reformer because in his day and age, the um, Brahmanism was the religion of the country of India, and the Brahmins were the priests, just like the Levites were the priests in Judaism at the time of Jesus. And the uh, Brahmins um, got paid for pouring ghee and water over stone statues and praying and chanting for the person who gave them the money and that was supposed to bring them to nearer to Atman the um, Godhead and the Buddha said nothing like that will ever happen <laughs> you'll practice that's it purification and of course the Brahmins were pretty angry at him for that Many of the Brahmins did become his uh, followers, but many remained angry because he undermined their security of their uh, business. And uh, by the same token, Jesus was trying to reform Judaism and was totally misunderstood of, in, in that uh, direction also, threw the money changes out of the temple and also wanted people to practice and uh, again the same thing happened that a new religion was started the Buddha did have had no intention of starting Buddhism he wanted to reform Brahmanism and uh, Jesus wanted to reform Judaism so in both cases a new religion started and when a new religion gets started again you have to deal with dogma and you have to deal with rites and rituals, which both of them shunned. So it's, um, it's up to each one of us to make it happen. And it's quite possible. Anything else? This is called comparative religion. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Now think of yourself as having a seed of enlightenment within. The beautiful jewel sparkling in all its facets, pure, absolute truth, enriching, promising complete freedom. And love this person who carries this beautiful jewel within.
Now put your attention on the person sitting nearest you in this hall. And recognize that same beautiful jewel within that person and love him or her for being the receptacle for this wonderful seed of enlightenment. Now think of everyone here carrying that beautiful jewel within and extend your love to everyone. Think of your parents carrying that beautiful jewel of enlightenment within their hearts and minds. Love them and embrace them, knowing that they too have this beautiful opportunity for total freedom. Think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you, who may be living with you. Think of this great jewel of enlightenment hidden in their hearts and minds. Love them, embrace them. being the carriers of this wonderful, brilliant, sparkling, rich inner life.
think of all your good friends, each one carrying the seed of enlightenment within. Embrace them with your wish to help them, to be their good friend. Fill them with the depths of your friendship and love. Think of all the people who have any connection with them, whom you meet in your everyday life. Let them all arise before your mind's eye. Customers, clients, colleagues, salespeople, postmen, anyone you can think of and see everyone with the jewel of the seed of enlightenment within love them and care for them embrace them with your love and friendship Think of anyone whom you either don't like or towards whom you're indifferent and look at that beautiful jewel, the seed of enlightenment within that person's heart and mind and love and care for that person because he or she too have that wonderful opportunity for freedom and enrichment. Now think of people everywhere, wherever you can picture them to be. Also those that you think are doing wrong things. And look at the jewel of enlightenment within their hearts and minds. Love them, care for them, embrace them, near and far.
put your intention back on yourself. and feel how you can come nearer to this jewel of a seed of enlightenment through making the right kind of effort of loving and caring how this jewel of a seed of enlightenment is brilliant and sparkling within your own heart Love it, love yourself, that you can actualize it. May beings everywhere cultivate the seed of enlightenment within. <laughs> 